Where's uh, Where's Shelly? Shelly, was you the choir director? Hold your hand up back there. I'm mad at the choir today. I'm mad because they, they just took my emotions and they just got them one way and then they'd run them the other way and then they'd run them the other way. I'm not kidding you, boy. I wanted to get down on the floor on my hands and knees when that old boy was singing that song. He don't look like he could sing, but... There he is, I tell you. And I wanted to get down on my knees, and I really did. I thought, you know, if I was a little less dignified, I would do it. Probably miss God, just like most of you did, but... I really did. I wanted to just get down on the floor, and I thought, don't, don't mess with this. Just leave this. This is wonderful. Let me feel this all afternoon. And I thought, boy... If they sing another one, they're going to mess this thing up. Then they started singing that one. I thought, yeah, that one's right. That's right. That. I'm glad they didn't sing on. I couldn't take much more. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I'm happy to be here today. And I need to come by here occasionally because I lose track of these Booker boys when I'm not around. We really, uh, a while back I came back and I was in church and I was looking around and I was saying, where is Philip? Where is he? Where is he? And finally, I asked somebody, I said, where's Philip? They said, well, he's back there standing by Joel. And I looked real close. I said, man, I didn't recognize Philip. He got tall and handsome and all that kind of stuff. Put glasses on. Man, I didn't recognize him. And today, this is God's truth. I was standing in there, and I said, where is Larry Andy? Where is Larry? Where, that scamp, where's he at? Did he even come to church today? And, and I, I looked down by in my mind, forgive me, I said, Brenda, but it's Sister Booker. I looked down and I said, who's that by Brenda? And I just kept on looking. I was really looking all over. For, and I said, there he is, that little scamp. He's growing up. So I need to come by here every now and then to Booker country and just check in, keep track of everything, make sure I know these boys are doing all right. Praise God. I was in Michigan recently and uh, I was in a little store. In fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago. And I was walking down... Uh, the aisle. They had treated us there about like you have treated us here, and I was buying some Alka Seltzer, if you want to know what I was doing, trying to survive the week. And uh, uh, they fed us and took good care of us. And I, I looked over, and there was a t shirt hanging on a rack, and I, I was so impressed by what it said. I stopped and read it several times. It said, When the white man came to this country, the Indians were running it. There was no interest rates, no deficit, and the women did all the work. And it said, and the white man thought he could improve on that system. Well, I want you to know, I don't think I can improve on anything that has happened in the last few days. It has been so good and so right and so rich, and the Lord has blessed. Boy, it's my honor to be here. I'm going to move quickly to the Scriptures, um, lest we be here all day, and... Uh, Book of Acts today, if you would open your Bible, I want to say welcome to the visitors that are here. I am not the pastor. The tall gentleman that was just greeting the congregation is the pastor. Um, I live over in the valley. I'm just here visiting today. And uh, welcome to you visitors. We're glad you're here today. And join in the festivities and the enjoyment. And, and we're just Pentecostal. We're not ashamed of that. That's the way we worship our God. Amen. I'm not a morning person. I struggle sometimes on Sunday mornings, and what's got me concerned is more and more, the older I get, I'm not an evening person either. <laughs> so the window that I can effectively do anything is shrinking year by year. <laughs> uh, there's more truth to that than you think. Amen. I remember these Lopez kids. They used to be in our section, and one night we had a fellowship meeting, and we were sitting talking to one of these boys, and the parents were off at another table, and and it was me and Brother Baglin, Brother Bob Baglin, and we looked at one of those boys and we said, Do you speak Spanish? And he looked it up at us. He said, My dad's a Mexican and my mother's a Mexican, but I'm not a Mexican. <laughs> Praise God. Home missions do funny things to you, I'm telling you. Praise God. I want these home missionaries to know how glad I am to be with them. Yes, Amen. Hallelujah. I know them, and so many of them are just precious people, and, and uh, I'm excited to be here. It's a wonderful day in the house of the Lord. Yes. Be happy. Be joyful. The Lord is good. Acts chapter number 18. If you would observe the reading of the Scripture with me. Thank you, Brother Booker, for the invitation to come. Brother Hyler, 
and these other missionary board members. Brother Clark is here today. God bless them. Love them all very much. Appreciate them. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, and from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed. How many? The Bible says, many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year, and six months, searching or teaching the Word of God among them. I'd like to ask you also to turn to First Corinthians. We have just read of Paul's going to a city called Corinth. Let me read to you from chapter 2 of a letter that he wrote back to the church that was established in that city. Chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm going to try today to talk to you about a very unlikely man and a very unlikely city. But my subject is an unlikely revival. An unlikely revival. We talked about faith yesterday. We talked about revival last night. And I want to talk about revival again by the help of the Lord. Let's ask God to bless His Word today. Would you pray? All of you pray. God in Jesus' name. you're going to listen and you're going to help me, you can be seated. If you're not, you can stand up with me the rest of the morning. I have to stand up every time I hear myself preach. Praise God. I would like for the home missionaries and their wives to really get a grasp on what I'm wanting to say today like for every preacher and his wife to get a new grasp on it today. But I would also like young people to get a grasp on what I'm going to say today. I would like Christian school teachers to get a grip on it. 
Sunday school teachers, anyone involved in the work of God in any capacity at all, even sound men. I want the sound men to get a grip on this today. Ushers and, and janitors and, and uh, whatever you are in life, I'd like for you to get a grip on this today. This message is for everybody, and it is something that all of us probably need to reaffirm in our life. If you observe the book of Acts, even in a casual way, you'll notice that there is a marked change in chapter number 13. The first 12 chapters of the book of Acts focus primarily around the life and ministry of a man that we call Simon Peter. At the juncture of chapter 13, Acts takes a radical turn, and from that moment on, It centers totally and completely on the life and the ministry of who we call the Apostle Paul. It is a very marked change in the book. It goes 12 chapters talking about Peter, and then it takes over with Paul, and the remainder of the book has to do primarily with him. The book of Acts follows the Apostle Paul on three what we call missionary journeys. And these journeys were completed on the northeastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Normally in the ancient world of his day, travel posed great hazard. There were pirates, there were barbarians, there were armies, there were hostile borders, there were all kinds of dangers and threats that would cause a person to be fearful. By the time that Paul began to make these journeys, Rome had established absolute mastery over a very wide and vast territory. And there was existent during the journeys of the Apostle Paul what we call the famous Pax Romana, which means world or empire-wide peace. This particular phenomena, this condition, only existed twice in a period of 700 years of Roman rule. Only two times in their 700-year history was there no war going on, and so there was peace. It was during one of these interludes of peace, one of these Pax Romanas, that the empire felt the impact not of military opposition, but the impact and the thrust of a single man by the name of the Apostle Paul. He was a very unlikely man was unlikely because during these missionary journeys, he was not robust, he was not powerful, he was not overwhelming, but I read to you today from his own testimony that much of the time it was in weakness, it was in fear, and it was in trembling. There wasn't anything about his physical makeup that would impress you. Historians tell us he was a small man, hunched-shouldered, Probably not at all the man that would attract your attention in a crowd. He just wasn't an impressive man. He was a very unlikely man. He had credentials in some areas. There was, of course, the fact that he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. There was also the fact that he was a Roman citizen. There was also the fact that he had command of several languages. We know that by the things that he did in the Scripture when he stood before various tribunals or councils or groups of men where he exhibited a a knowledge of different languages. So he had some things in his favor. But his particular character makeup would not qualify him nor single him out as a man that would bring great revival to any particular city or any consecutive group of cities. In his missionary journeys, Paul focused primarily on what we would call trade towns, capital cities people and places that were Roman colonies that would be a melting pot and thus a distribution center to the rest of the world. When you read the places that he went, which many of them have become books of your Bible, the book of Galatians is written to a region of churches like we would call a state today. Or if you read the book written to Ephesus, or you read the book written to Coloss, or you read the book written to Rome and others in the Scripture, Thessalonica and other places that Paul wrote, By the end of his life, 
Paul had left a ring of burgeoning churches around the Mediterranean Sea that, that we look back on today that was nothing short of miraculous. It was quite a feat to realize what this man accomplished in his lifetime. Uh, historians tell us that he was very possibly the most converted man that ever lived. When you observe his life and what he did and his accomplishments, probably more than any other, he represented a total, complete conversion to Christianity. I want to tell you that he is an unlikely man because at the moment that I would like to try and preach about tonight or this morning is, I told you I wasn't a morning person, praise God. That's why I said tonight instead of this morning. I'll wake up today about 4 o'clock, but uh, you, you can't sleep today. Just let me sleep through my message, but you have to... Be wide awake. Reach over and pinch your neighbor and say, are you awake? Praise God. I'm in Booker country, so I can relax a little bit. Brother Clark asked me if I noticed Brother Booker's, uh, what would we call that while ago? Signal. Signal. He said, did you see that signal? And the signal was the song leader was leading songs, and Brother Booker was through with him leading songs. He just reached up and kicked him like that on the leg. And all of you couldn't see it, but we did, and we thought, boy, what a signal. I'm going to try that when I get home. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. A lot of finesse. Yeah, it's a love tap, he said. Love tap, love tap. Praise God. <laughs> I don't want any of your love taps. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. So I'll relax because I am in Booker country today. The reason that I am telling you today that it was an unlikely man is if you follow the Apostle Paul in Acts chapters 16 and chapter 17 and chapter 18, immediately before he arrived at Corinth, you will find what is considered his darkest days of his ministry. They were not glorious days of revival. Everything wasn't happening the way you would like for it to happen. This little failure journey that I want to talk about this morning began when he arrived in Philippi. I will not take time to enumerate all of the details, but he made several stops before he got to Philippi. But it was at Philippi that things took a turn for the worse and seemed to continually go down. When he got to Philippi, it looked promising because he went out to the river bank and there he met a woman that was wont to pray. And the Bible calls her Lydia and she was baptized in her house and things immediately started looking up. Soon after that, he was going around and he heard a voice behind him and there was a young damsel who was possessed by a spirit of divination who began to follow him wherever he went and say, These men are the servants of the Most High God. And that got a little irritating after a while. And so after Paul had exhausted the fruit of the Spirit that he had and he finally got all of that that he could take, he finally turns to the damsel and he casts the spirit of divination out of her. And that's a wonderful little Bible story. The only problem was what it produced was some very angry people who made a living off of her divination. This morning I decided to take advantage of the beautiful country and I went down to the, uh, the pier for a few moments and thought I'll breathe the sunshine and I'll walk the pier and I did and I went in a little place to get some coffee to help me wake up to the world and the lady was reading a horror book, and I thought, man, what a thing to read at 9 o'clock in the morning. Amityville Horror, she was reading. And, and I said, do you enjoy reading those scary books at this time of day? And, and she, she be just opened up, started telling me about Ouija boards and spirits and divination. And, and I thought to myself, I thought, if I was one of those home missionaries, I'd testify to this lady. But I'm not. I'm getting out of here. Praise God. Sunday morning, I ain't messing with Ouija boards and devils and spirits today. I probably wouldn't have done it the way Paul did. I'd have probably packed my bags and went to another town. But Paul turned and rebuked that spirit out of her and got, got them folks mad at him. You know what they did? The Bible says the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes. I really just want to take my coat off, but I'll use this example. He rent off their clothes, and I promise that's as far as I'll go. That's what Mark Boston said one morning. He said, can I take off my coat? I said, sure, Elder. He said, I promise that's as far as I'll go. The magistrates went off their clothes and commanded to beat them. To beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison. 
Now, we preach about the glorious deliverance out of the jailhouse, and we preach about how wonderful it was for Paul and Silas to be hanging in those stocks, beaten and miserable at the midnight hour, and boy, we can really glorify that, that experience. But I'm telling you what, I'm glad it happened to Paul and not to me. Maybe you got some sad old monkeyistic ideas in life that you want to be tortured and beaten so you can stand up bloody and, and wobbly in front of the church and say, Boy, I'm telling you what, I, I don't want to be a martyr. I don't mind telling you. I, I have no desire for people to beat around on me and rough me up for the gospel's sake. I don't mind preaching about Paul and Silas, but I don't have some inward, twisted, uh, perverted mentality about God loves me better if he beats me all the time. But we glorify this little instance in Philippi. They're, they're in the stocks, and boy, they're singing. And, and oh, we, we, we come up with all these cute little dittos about what they were singing. I don't know what they were singing. I don't know. But anyway, you know the story. I'm just going to pass briefly over it. At midnight, they're singing and giving praise to God. The earthquake happens. The jailer pounces in there. says, hey, what do I do to be saved? They baptize in the same hour of the night. And, and we have a tendency to say, boy, revival was coming to Philippi. I want to tell you that it wasn't quite that way. When he woke up the next morning, he still had the stripes on his back. He still had the puffy black eye and the busted lips. He still had the beating that they had laid on him the day before. And the Bible lets us to know that when it was all said and done, it says they desired them to depart out of their city. We like you, Paul. We're really glad you came by to see us, but would you please leave? So he leaves Philippi. Well, you know, everybody can have one bad experience. These folks testified they had another church up in Michigan before they came to the promised land. Praise God. Everybody can have a bad experience. Brother Booker got saved in the wilderness of Oklahoma, but God delivered him and brought him to California. You know, we can all have, we can all have one bad experience before. And so, you know, just mark Philippi off. It was a bad deal, and they all had bad attitudes and bad spirits and a bunch of devils. And, but we'll just go on down the road here and we'll just go on down to uh, Thessalonica and we'll have a revival down there. Praise God, praise God. So he went to Thessalonica, chapter 17. And he went to the synagogue and he reasoned for three days with them in the synagogue and uh, tried to talk to them a little bit about God and that Jesus was the Christ and he was preaching that to them. And the Bible lets us to know that what happened in Thessalonica was not a wonderful earth-shaking revival. He didn't baptize a bunch of folks. But the Scripture says that all the city was set on an uproar, and they assaulted the house of Jason where he was trying to get things together. And they drew out Jason and the brethren and the rulers of the city. They said, we want to tell you something. And we, again, we glorify this Scripture. They turned the world upside down. But they weren't saying it with that connotation. They were saying, these are the guys that are tearing everything up everywhere they go. And so they weren't happy with them. And the Bible says they troubled the people and the rulers of the city. And so finally, you know what they did? They came to Paul and said, we would <clears throat> really appreciate it, Paul. We're glad you came by Thessalonica on your little missionary journey. But uh, <clears throat> praise God, would you, would you leave? Would you go away? We, we really don't want you here at Thessalonica. And the Bible says he left. And not only did he leave, but it wasn't the rulers that sent him away. The Bible says the brethren sent him away. Now, I'm reading the King James Version. This is not the Louis Dewey Version. This is <laughs> King James Version says the uh, brother. That would be one thing if the Catholics got mad at me today and said, we're tired of all that screaming and ranting and raving. Would you get out of our city? I'd probably just say thank you, but no, no, not really. I'd really just say, well, I'm sorry, I'll do my best. But, but, you know, if the elder came to me and said, Brother Bo, we really appreciate you being here, but would you please go home? We've had all the help we can stand from you. That's what happened at Thessalonica. The brethren said to Paul, please leave. Not badly, probably to protect him. But the fact remains that he was asked to leave by the brethren. The Bible says the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. Well, okay, we had a couple of bad deals. Philippi went belly up and we got beat up pretty bad there. But, you know, that, that was all right. Went down to Thessalonica and maybe we just didn't do everything just right. But maybe at Berea. That's, uh, Berea. When we get to Berea, we're going to have a revival. And so they go down to Berea. And sure enough, things started well. And many of them believed, the Bible says, Honorable women, which are Greeks, and of men, not a few. But the Jews that were at Thessalonica did not forget about 
Paul and his trouble that he caused at Thessalonica. And so they came down to Berea and they began to stir things up. And they began to cause trouble there also. And the Bible says that when that happened immediately, not two weeks later, not after a large campaign, but immediately the brethren sent away Paul, as it were, to go to the sea. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. I'm saying it in a very jovial way today, but I'm telling you it wasn't funny to the Apostle Paul. He was investing his life, and he went to Philippi, and it didn't work. And he went to Thessalonica, and it didn't work. And he went to Berea, and it didn't work. And he thought, well, I'll go to Athens. Maybe I can strike something in Athens. That's I'm reading to you what happened before he got to Corinth. That's why he said in chapter 2, when I got there, it was in weakness, it was in fear, it was in much trembling. He was a beaten, broken man when he finally staggered into Corinth. He was not the apostle that had had raging success in all the cities that he had been to. He wasn't coming off the high wave of revival in city after city that you and I kind of get a mental idea of what he was doing. But I'm telling you that the great apostle was struggling. The apostle called of God to preach to the Gentiles. It was all he could do to keep himself pulled up to day level every day. It was all he could do to keep himself going and motivated. And the brethren were propping him up and trying to help him along. He was an unlikely man to have any kind of a great revival. Just before he went to Corinth, he made one more stop after Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, and he came to Athens. And it was there that Bible expositors and Bible historians say Paul faced his most crucial test of his ministry. He was not dealing with wayward Jews. He was not dealing with the theology of the Samaritans. He was not dealing with with some carnal ideology. But he was dealing with the most intelligent people on the face of the earth. History recalls them simply as the intelligentsia. And as he made his way to Athens, who knew what was going to happen when he got there. But he made up his mind, I'm on my way. I might as well stop off in Athens. And the concluding verses of chapter number 17 talks about his sojourn in the city of Athens. Athens. I want you to know that Athens was not a hotbed, Bible Belt believing church group of people. The ancients tell us that it was easier to find a God in Athens than it was to find a man. And to this city of intelligence, to this city of every new God that came along, in walks this unlikely man going to preach to them about the Christ. It was his way to go to the synagogue and reason with them out of scriptures and from that glean people that he could get a toehold and hang on for sometimes up to three years he spent in a particular city. But when he got to Athens, there were other kinds of things that he had never encountered before. The Bible said certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And he fought a raging duel with people that were far different than anything he had ever come in contact with before. He walked among the gods and he said, I'm telling you what you got are messing up here. You've got every God there is under heaven. You've even got a God over here, the unknown God. At least let me talk to you about Him. And He tried to talk to them about Jesus Christ. But the Bible says when He got to the resurrection, they began to mock Him. And they began to laugh at Him. And say, what kind of an idea is this? Who do you think we are, the resurrection? One of the things that the early apostles had to encounter was a sect known as Gnosticism. I don't know if you've ever read of it or not, but as the gospel began to make its way around certain parameter cities of, of the Greek uh, world of that day and the, and the Roman ideology of that day, they, encode, they encountered different things. And one of them was a cult called Gnosticism. Gnosticism balked at the concept of God becoming a man. Gnosticism believed that the body that you live in is intrinsically evil, and therefore God would never live in a human body. God would never be a man, and therefore Jesus was either a spirit or an imposter. And as these apostles went to these cities and they began to deal with these things, they had to contend with it. That's why John wrote his book, First John. That's why when you open it up, the very first of it says, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have handled with our hands, the word of life. That's why you read in chapter 4, verses 2 and verses 3, he says, if anybody says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, the same is the spirit of Antichrist. They were fighting against it's these intelligent people that said God did not come in a human body. And when Paul got to Athens, he encountered these intelligentsia, these brilliant people that could argue effectively out of the reasoning of human minds. And Paul did not do a great work in Athens. 
The Bible makes a little encapsulated statement that I think if Paul were here testifying this morning in this whole missions retreat, he could elaborate a lot when it says in verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. It doesn't leave any overtone of victory or glory or revival. I am submitting to you today that at this point in Paul's life, he was the most unlikely man to have a revival. There wasn't anybody less qualified. Four cities in a row he struck out. Four times. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. And he staggers at that point of his life. Are you listening to me? Is everybody listening? Raise your hand if you're listening. Good, good. At that point of his life, he walks into the most unlikely city in the Roman Empire to have a revival. It's incredible how God designs a man's life. It's like God allowed him to be beaten, mutilated, flattened, everything knocked out of him. And then God says, okay, it's time to go to Corinth. Corinth, I, I decided last year that I wanted to understand a little more Bible history, and so I've worked on that this last year. And, and uh, I read about some of the cities that are mentioned in the Scripture. I read about Corinth and some of the things that that they stood for and believed and, and, and what it was. And Corinth was the second largest city in the empire, second only to Rome. When Paul walked into Corinth, beaten and broken and low in spirit, Corinth boasted a population of 700,000 people. It was the second largest city in the empire. It was known for chewing up and spitting out new religions. The average new religion lasted in Corinth 90 days. That's how long it took them to absorb the propagator of the new religion into their fun and games. Corinth was known for its ribald lifestyle. In the Roman language, when they spoke the verb, Corinthian eyes meant to live shamelessly and immorally. When they talked about the Corinthians, it was much as we do with ethnic jokes. You know, we get to telling these ethnic jokes and making fun of people. And, and maybe, a, like my daughter's a blonde, we tell her blonde jokes all the time. You know, I told her the other day, I said, you know what? I'm sorry, all the blondes. It's, I'm talking about my daughter, right? But I said, you know why blondes smile when it lightning? She said, no, Dad, why? I said, they think they're getting a picture taken. You know, we have a tendency to make those ethnic jokes and, and, and poke fun at people that are particular. You know, they tell Pollock jokes and Aggie jokes. And up in Canada, they tell Newfie jokes. And, you know, you all kinds of jokes. Well, in the Roman Empire, they told Corinthian jokes. Do you hear me? Because their ideology toward the Corinthians is they are nothing but a bunch of shameless, immoral people that don't care anything about morality or life or goodness or God. And so the average religion lasted 90 days. And so when they went to Corinth, they knew that it was lewd and immoral and bad. Most cities have a bad section of town where you can find immorality rampant. They'll have adult bookstores and they'll have street walkers and they'll have immorality rampant in certain sections of the city. If you go to New Orleans, it's down on Bourbon Street. If you go to New York, it's down on Times Square. And if, but if you go to Las Vegas, it's everywhere. They tell me. Now, I don't know. I haven't been everywhere in Las Vegas, but they tell me it's everywhere. That's the way it was in Corinth. When you got to Corinth, you didn't have to look for immorality. You didn't have to go to a section of town where it was rampant. They worshipped everything that money could buy. Corinth was, are you listening to me? It was the most unlikely city in the whole empire that a revival would come to. It would be like if you were saying, Paul, wait a minute, you struck out at Philippi. Thessalonica didn't work. Berea was a downward turn for your ministry. You didn't do so hot at Athens. Stay away from Corinth until you're on top of things. Don't go there right now. Wait just a minute, Paul. It's too hard a nut to crack. It's too bad a city to go to. I'm telling you, it's wicked. It's evil. It's bad. They're God of their city and brother Booker was there with me when we went to Corinth. The god of their city was the goddess Venus. They worshipped the goddess of love. They had a temple set on the hill where 1,000 prostitutes serviced the worshippers at that temple and that shrine. It was that 
city that this unlikely man walked into. The most unlikely city in the entire empire to be converted. No one expected much from Corinth. I'm sure when Timotheus, Silas, and other co-workers of Paul heard him say, well, I think I'll go to Corinth. It was like, why? Can't you see they're not taking you at Thessalonica, Berea? You know, at least the Bereans were more noble than those at Thessalonica and that they said to search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. At least these people have some kind of a conscience. Corinth, Paul, it's the cesspool of the Roman Empire. It's where they all are wicked and immoral. It was at that point, with that background, I want you to understand. It was at Paul's lowest ministry point. He got there shaken and discouraged. He got there feeling like he was striking out everywhere he went. And this is what I want to preach to you today. The most unlike the man, the most unlike the city. And the Bible lets us to know that he was there a year and six months. I read it to you in Acts 18. It said many believed on him. Many were baptized. What, what happened? You mean, Paul, you... Turn, turn to Second Corinthians, I think it's 12 and 7, Brother Booker. You will. What, what happened? Paul, man, you go to places where there should be revival and they beat the tar out of you. And then you go to the most unlikely city in the empire. And you have the greatest, if not at least the second greatest revival. The New Testament records the most unlikely revival possible happened in Corinth. Paul stayed 18 months and your Bible, which uses adjectives sparingly, said many believed. Many were baptized. And God speaks to him in a vision by night. I have many people in this city. I want to preach to you that what I believe happened was God broke Paul. God smashed him down to the finest residue that he wants a preacher to be. Because Paul said, I've tried it in Philippi. I tried it in Thessalonica. I tried it in Berea. I tried it in Athens and nothing worked. And when his back was against the wall, you hear me. He said, I'm just going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And see what will happen. No more fancy revelations. No more arguing in the court places. I'm backed against the wall and I'm broken and I'm weak and I'm weary. And I don't even know if I can get anything going here. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do in wicked, vile, shameless, immoral Corinth. I am just going to preach Jesus. That's all. I want you to know this was the man that according to his own mouth had abundant revelations. What does it say? And lest I should be lest exalted, I should be what exalted exalted above measure through the abundance through the abundance of the revelation of revelation it wasn't that he didn't have any other knowledge that he could impart to Corinth it was simply the fact that I'm telling you nothing else is working nothing else is doing any good the world needs to hear Jesus they don't need to hear my fancy revelations they don't need to hear my great messages they need to hear that he died that he resurrected that he was God come to save them. I want you to know that in my opinion, and I don't mean this critically or arrogantly here today, but in my opinion, we hear far too many messages that are our own revelations. We hear far too many things of people trying to delve in the Scriptures and dig some deep, dark secret out of it somewhere where there's a world that's lost and hungry. Brother Hyler, would you go to John chapter 1 and, and hold that for just a moment. What I am preaching to you today, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a home Bible study teacher, whether you run the tape booth, or whether you're an usher, or whether you're a janitor in the church, or you sing in the choir, or whether you're a preacher or a preacher's wife, it doesn't make any difference who you are. There needs to be a fresh anointing on our mind concerning the oneness of God and concerning who Jesus Christ was because that is what the world is hungry to hear. That is what they want to hear. We need to get again the desire and the burden that this world needs a revival. 
You won't think me sacrilegious today for touching the sacred cow. They don't need to hear about the United Pentecostal Church. They don't need to hear about your name or who you are or what you can perform. They need to hear about Jesus. And what I'm telling you is, the most unlikely man in the most unlikely city brought the most unlikely revival by just preaching Jesus, just preaching the oneness of God, preaching about who he was. I'm telling you today, it still works in 1993. What would happen if all of us again got the burden in our heart that we weren't consumed with advertising our church? We weren't consumed with advertising a program for a format. But we just said, you know what the world needs to hear? They need to hear about one God. They need to hear about Jesus Christ. They need to hear the simplicity of His message. I'm not bending the Scripture today when I tell you. I'm not taking anything out of context today when I tell you that the Apostle Paul was a beaten man. He was staggering and reeling from the blows that had been inflicted on him over the past few months and years due to what he had experienced there in those other cities. And when he got to Corinth, his greatest challenge in life, he laid aside all of the deep revelations that God had given him. He laid aside all of the things that he could have wowed them with. He said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. But he said, I'm telling you, Corinth, I made up my mind when my sandals made their tracks leading into your city that I would only preach to you about Jesus, that's all. And we'll find out what happens. And I'm telling you, he did it. And God sent the most unlikely revival that the world had ever seen because he preached Christ. Let's lift our hands and ask God to help us today. Hallelujah. I ask you today, preacher, when did our movement experience its greatest percent of growth? When did our churches burgeon and bust into growth and glory? Was it when we had deeper life conferences? No. When was it? I'll tell you when it was. It was when God gave the revelation about the oneness of God and they stepped out from the Trinitarian churches at the turn of the century. That's when oneness churches blossomed with growth. That's when they swelled in a greater percentage than we have seen in recent decades. I'm contending that the reason they did wasn't because we were smart. It wasn't because we had the right programs. But it was because we got a hold of the same concept that Paul got a hold of here and said, we don't know very much world, but we're telling you there's one God and His name is Jesus. And we don't have a lot on the ball. And we don't have the beautiful buildings. And we don't have some of the things that other groups have. But we just got a raw message about God and who He is. And I'm telling you, God blessed it. And our church is filled up. And people got saved. And we baptize them in the name of the Lord. You hear me today? We need to get back to preaching God. We need to get back to preaching Jesus. If you want to call this an old-fashioned one God message, that'll be all right with me. But I'm going to tell you inside every single one of us is a God consciousness. And when a preacher taps in on that God consciousness, it does something that nothing else will do. I've preached and been blessed to, and able to travel enough to tell you that I've preached in liberal churches and conservative churches. I've preached many places in America and Canada and other countries of the world. I've never been in a congregation that wasn't stirred when you started preaching about God. When you start preaching about the oneness of God, there's something that reaches down inside people and it comes out of them and they start saying yes, 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 yes. That's why you jerk Trinitarians out their churches when you start preaching about one God because their spirit says yes 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 that's right that's right something inside me bears witness to that I want to prove it to you by the word of God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God what's it say verse 2 the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made now get this in him was what life and the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. Darkness comprehended it not. Read on. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came to bear witness of the light. Now read on. He was not that light. But was sent to bear witness of that light. That next verse, what's it say? That was the true light. Get this. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. 
You hear me? There's a little God consciousness on the inside of everybody. And when you go home and preach about one God, and you preach about the goodness of God, you reach inside that man and you turn on the light. You reach inside that woman and you turn on the light. That was the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Tell me about your agnostic. Tell me about your atheist and put him in a foxhole with bullets zipping over his head. He'll look around. He'll get down on his knees and say, Now, God, if you're really up there, I want you to save me. Don't tell me people don't believe in God. Don't tell me it's not down inside there. I'm not against programs. I'm not against dramas. I'm not against presentation. I'm not against special things in your church. We do it too. But I'm saying if you want to have a revival, you've got to touch the God consciousness of that person. Somewhere you've got to reach inside them and say, we're going to talk about God today. We're not going to talk about some deep, dark revelation. We're not going to talk about something you can't understand. We're going to tell you there's one God, and His name is Jesus. His name name is Jesus. He died for you. He resurrected that you could be saved. We want to look down our nose at charismatic churches. We want to look down our nose at some of the modern churches in America because they don't preach what we claim to be the gospel of truth. But I am telling you, they do have a revelation on this. They preach the simplicity of Christ. They preach the simplicity of God. And then they turn around and make him some kind of a triune God and destroy it. But I'm telling you, we need to get back to the simplicity of one God. One God. One God. My pastor was, of course, renowned for his ability to preach on one God. And I say this not in any sense condemnatory. I'm not judging anything. I'm just telling you. It's a rare meeting that I attend that I hear anybody preach on one God. It's rare. And sometimes they'll allude to it for a moment or two and hype the people up for just a moment. But if you hear one God preached, you usually hear it in your home church with your pastor. It's just not a popular thing to go, like today, to a home missions retreat and preach about one God. I wish today that I had the ability to instill the old fire and thrill back into every saint of God Every home Bible study teacher, every Sunday school teacher, every Christian school teacher, every assistant to the pastor, every preacher, every preacher's wife to get fired up again about one God, one God. Turn, Elder, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Turn in Isaiah, chapter 9, if you would. Turn in Isaiah, chapter 43, if you would. And if the next few moments bore you, I'm sorry. It just doesn't bore me. I've decided in my life, you know what, Paul, when all your glorious revelations didn't work, I couldn't relate to those anyway. I don't get deep revelations. I'm up to my ears and paying the bills and keeping the marriages put together and the young people apart. Praise God. That's what I spend my time doing. Young people apart and husbands and wives together. Praise God. Y'all want to get together? Just get married. You'll be apart. Praise God. I don't have time for great revelations. I wish I did. I wish I could do these great marriage seminars. I, I wish I could do these star-studded uh, uh, deals that they do in seminars. Praise God. It's just all I can do to keep the bills paid. Keep them paying the tithes. Get some praying through every now and then. And I'm thrilled to know that Paul's greatest weapon was not some deep dark secret, but when his back was to the wall and he was in the toughest crisis of his life, he fell back on just preaching one God. One God. One God. Let me tell you who Jesus is. And a revival broke out. Do I think it'll work? You better believe I think it'll work. Brother Terry was a tremendous one God preacher. I don't want to offend anybody here today, and I know we have visitors, but my old pastor didn't have a lot of dignity when he first went to Bakersfield. He put a 40-foot long sign on the outside of the church that said Trinitarianism is the way to hell. Tact wasn't his greatest virtue. You may know who Sam White is. Sam White got saved and Sunday morning. I think he got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and he wasn't there Sunday night. But Terry wasn't looking for him. He was down at the Assembly of God Church. He walked right in the Assembly of God Church, got him and brought him out. But Terry used to go to the Trinitarian churches. And during old-time ways, they had testimony service. You know, they'd just say, anybody want to testify? So Brother Terry would stand up and start testifying. And he'd testify about one God. And he would just go on and on and on. Until finally they would start playing the music or singing a song and make him sit down. There was something in those old war horses, in that era that came out of 
of struggle. That I, I, I am afraid that we're losing it in 1993. I'm afraid that we're not realizing the true value and impact that preaching about God has to a congregation. I'm afraid that we're forgetting when a sinner comes in off the street that God put something inside of them. There is a light inside them that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And you may preach about some deep, dark secret. You may preach about something that impresses you and all your choir and all your staff. And the sinner sits there scratching their head saying, What in the world is this all about? But when you preach about God, I want you to know every sinner understands it. Inside them is a voice that says, I need God. I'm telling you, I don't know what kind of church this is. I don't know what you do around here. But I need God. I need help. I need God. Paul fell back on it. Paul fell back on it as his last resort and had the most unlikely revival the world ever saw. What better thing could you do, home missionary, than go home and preach about one God? What better thing could you do, Sunday school teacher, than to look your children in the eye and say, there's one God, one God, one God, one God. Parents, what greater thing could you give your children than the knowledge there's one God, one God, one God. Now, these verses might not mean much to you, but I was raised on them, and there's something about them that turns my key. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. What does it There ought to be something in this. If you really love God, this touches something way down deep inside it. It gets you when we read it. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us, what? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace that ought to put something down inside your feet. That ought to put something down inside you. Yeah, I know Him. I know who He is. He's my Savior. I'm here to tell you it does not bore me. It doesn't bother me. Preach on, preacher. Tell me about God. Tell me who He is. Tell me what His name is. Glory to God. <laughs> Let's lift our hands and thank God for the revelation of who He is. Hallelujah. Brother Clark, would you, would you give me a scripture? 1 Timothy 3.16. Isaiah 43, verse number 10. You are my witnesses. Sayeth the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may what? That you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me, What? There was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Verse 11 says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Then why don't you explain to me Luke chapter 2 and verse 11 when the angel said to the shepherds in the field, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's either the same Savior or he's a liar. I'm telling you, he's the Savior. The baby that Mary held in her arms was the Savior of the world. No. It ain't dark today. It's not deep and it's not hard to understand. But I'm telling you, it rings the bell of every person that ever drew a breath on planet Earth because it's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And whether Paul had that knowledge or he inadvertently fell into it, I know not. I only know that when he was pressed out of measure, when he was in weakness and fear and trembling, when he faced the greatest crisis of his life, when he was backed against the wall with no way to know where to go or turn, he said, all I'm going to do is preach to you Christ and him crucified. And God gave him the greatest revival the Roman Empire saw. 
Somebody ought to be encouraged to go home and preach on one God. Somebody ought to go home and say, I'm going to talk about it on the job. I'm going to testify to my friends at work. I'm going to talk about it at school. I'm going to talk about it in the grocery store. Everywhere I go, I'm going to quit promoting a program or a church. And I'm going to promote God. I'm going to promote who He is, who Jesus is. How can you close the Bible? It wasn't done. All right. I, somebody else. Oh, yeah. Isaiah, you, you, my friend. Go to Isaiah 44. Oh, she had it open, friend. Woo. Isaiah 44 and 6. Thus saith the Lord. 44 and 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. I am the last. Beside me. Can I stop for a moment and do a little I.H. Terry number here? Okay, this is an I.H. Terry number, right? Come here, Brother Mueller. Sit right here. Come here, Brother Baker. Sit right here. Okay? Just for the sake of defending truth, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Three persons, co-equal, co-existent. Okay? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But in this scripture, he said, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. I am the last. And beside me... You say you're taking it out of context. I, you take it any way you want to, but beside me, uh-uh. This, I'm all by myself. Beside me, beside me, there is no God. Is there God beside me? He said, I know not any. <laughs> no, sir. There's one. And if you don't believe that, go to Revelation 4 and 1. He said, I saw a throne and one sat on that throne. Praise God. Sit down. I'm almost done. I'll just be a few more minutes. Just, did we get verse 8? We didn't do verse 8, did we? It's too good to pass out. All right? Verse 8. Fear you not. Neither be afraid. Don't be afraid. What's the name of your town? Elko? Don't be afraid of Elko and gold miners and deer hunters. What's your Chino? Don't be afraid of those inmates and those. Don't be afraid of the, the, the bloods that go down there and all those gangs. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Why? Because you know who's on your side? Fear you not, neither be afraid. Huh? What's it say? Have I not told thee from that time and have declared it unto you? Is there a God? But you're not going to get a God come along bigger than your God. He said, is there a God beside me? I know. No, not any. I'm telling you, your God is the God of the universe, the God of the heavens, the God of the earth, the God of the wind and the rain. He's God. He's God. He's God. He's God. He's God. He's, God. He's living inside you. You know who He is. An unlikely man, an unlikely man, an unlikely city, and an unlikely revival. How did he have it? By preaching one God. The devils believe and tremble. They hate it when you preach about one God. They want you to preach about social programs. The devil hopes you preach about something so dark and deep and mysterious that when they go home they think, boy, that was really something. I need, I need a lexicon to understand that. I need some kind of Bible dictionary. But when you preach about one God, everybody understands. And it reaches into that center. It reaches into the heart of that center and turns on the light. That was the light that comes to every man. The light. The light. I was recently, recently preaching a meeting in another state. And I was, believe it or not, I was preaching on one God. I made up my mind I'm going to preach some of these things. I made up my mind that when I go places, I want to preach about some of the fundamental things. And I want to preach about divine healing. And I want to preach about the name. If I had time this morning, I'd get into the name and the fact that we have his name today. I don't have time. In fact, I need to quit, but I'm, I'm going to. But I, I want you to know that some of these fundamental things are not dead, boring subjects. They have life in them. They have joy in them. And you need to go home, you preachers, and get involved with it again and fall in love again with the basic doctrine. First Timothy 3.16, I was preaching a meeting and there was an old preacher there. He was 68 years old. I said, Brother Irvin, I said, stand and read this verse for me. When he stood and opened his Bible, Brother Clark, he just started trembling all over. He, he, he was like this. 
I'm not exaggerating. He, he, he couldn't control himself. He was holding that Bible. And, and he started reading this verse. Read it to him. 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. When he got to this part, he was shaking so bad he couldn't hardly hold his Bible. He was actually quoting it. He knew it so well. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Whatever God was, God was received up into glory. After church, I said, Brother Irvin, I want to know what happened to you when you started reading that verse. Tears started rolling down his face. He said, when I first came to the Lord, I didn't know truth, and I came to God in a church of God of prophecy. And he said, it was about three or four years later that I came to God in a little backwoods church in Arkansas. He said, this is the verse that God gave me, the revelation on who he was. He said, I just can't read it without having a reaction. I just can't read this verse without it going all over me where God brought me from and how privileged I am to have the revelation of who He is. I'm appealing to you today. I'll plead with you today. Don't lose the wonder of who God is. Don't lose it in the, in the, in the push and the shove of 1993 and all of the things that we're involved in. Get a fresh touch of it. Get a fresh joy of it. Get a fresh want to of it and go back again to your city. And preach about the oneness of God. I could give you many scriptures today. Colossians 2.9 For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10 says you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. We could talk about 1 Timothy 2.5 There's one God, one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. We could talk about John 5.39 When Jesus looked at His followers and His skeptics and said search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans then. All they had was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And I can say them. I'm not going to do it to impress you. I'm telling you they had the Old Testament. all they had. And Jesus said, you go get your nose in the Old Testament. That's what testifies of me. Search the Scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Read John 4, 24. God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Read First John 5 and 7. There's one, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. Read First John 5 and 20. Read Revelation 1 and 8. Read, read, I'm telling you in your Bible. You'll find out there's one God and His name is Jesus. I'll throw this in just for good measure. This is, I didn't plan on this. I'll throw this in. Brother Booker, would you go to Revelation chapter 20? You know, I get tired of people telling me, well, there's two people in God. I know there is, because I read Galatians 1 and 1. It says, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I read in Ephesians 1 and 1. And I read in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 1 and 1. Have you ever read those scriptures where it will say something like, Blessed be the God and our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That at and throws them. That and says now that, see, there's two people. But you know what I do with folks like that? I make them read me all those scriptures. I want to hear all of them. Read them. There's one in Galatians. There's one in Ephesians. And they just read them. They've got a Cheshire grin on their face. Our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. See, see, two. I say, how many? Two. Boy, I just make them get in good and deep. Good and deep. How many gods? Two. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if they don't say two gods, they say two persons. Two people. Just two persons. Three persons in the Godhead. Here's two of the persons. God the Father. Are you getting the drift? I don't need to belabor the point, do I? Are you getting the drift? There's about 12 or 15 places in the uh, epistles that it mentions this. When they have totally exhausted all these verses, I usually go to Revelation chapter 20 and say, is it all right if I apply your doctrine to the devil? How many devils are there? And they say, oh, only one devil. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20. Read. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. I saw an angel come down from heaven. Having the key, having the key to the bottom of his pen. And a great chain in his hand. Uh-huh. And he laid hand. And he laid hand. Laid hold. On the dragon. On the dragon. That old serpent. That old serpent. Which is the devil. Now go real slow here. So everybody gets this. Which, which is the devil. And I say, now I ask him now, how many devils is there? Oh, just one devil. Which is the devil. And, and Satan. Satan. And I say, now how many devils is there? And they go, huh, one. <laughs> one. 
What does this mean? They said, well, that's just two names of the same person. Now, that's exactly what I've been trying to tell you. When it talks about God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, it's two names of the same person. There's one God. There may only be one devil, but there's only one God. Let's stand to our feet, lift our hands to God, and give Him some glory today. Unlikely man, an unlikely city, and an unlikely revival. I hope you're encouraged about one God. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'll just do what I want, I guess. All they can do is make me leave. I'm leaving as soon as I get done anyway. You home missionaries and your wives, would you come and just stand across the front today? Some have had to go, but those that are still here, would you come and stand? And would the choir please come? The choir that sang earlier is coming back up. Come back up. Come on, Brother Sanger. I don't know your name, but get on up here, brother. Choir, you don't need all the mics and fancy stuff. Just come up here and sing. I want you to sing that second song, Sister Kelly, wherever you are. That second song. Get that one that makes you want to get on the floor and put your face in the carpet. That great God saved us. These missionary families, Brother Lopez, step over here if you would. Just make room here. Kind of spread out. Bronzios, would you come? Just kind of spread across. I want to tell this church that these couples face battles that you'll never know anything about. It is impossible for you to understand the pressure that they are under at times. They're under every bit as much pressure as Paul was when he walked into Corinth. Some of them, while I was preaching today, could say, you know what, I can relate to that. Because it seems like no matter what I've tried, it hadn't worked. It's not working. And I wondered if you as a church would be willing to just come up, stand around behind these couples today. While the choir sings this song again, pray for them that God would send them a revival to their city. Would you do that as a church? It's not asking a whole lot of commitment out of you today. They need the strength that this church can send them home with. Come on and stand up. The choir is going to begin to sing this song again. Okay, tell you. Sing it again. You preachers, let's lay hands on these couples and pray for them. For my transgression, that he paid the price a long, long time ago. When he gave his life for me. On a hill called Calvary But there's something else I want to know Cause he still feel the nail Every time I pray And you hear the crowd cry crucify again Oh, am I causing him pain? And I know I've got to change Cause I just can't bear the thought of her They tell me Jesus died for my transgression And that he paid the price a long, long time ago When he gave his life for me on a hill called Calvary Oh, but there's something else I want to know Does he still feel the nails Every time I pray Can he hear the crowd cry crucify again Oh, am I causing you pain then I know I've got to change Cause I just can't bear the thought of hurting him Does he still steal the nails Every time I pray Can I hear the clouds I crucify again Oh, am I causing him way then I know I've got to change Cause 
Yeah. 